then let me just say what happened. So I'm on Twitter today, minding my own business. Someone cites my book, Against IP, and uh, this chick, Nina Prevo, um, who's got a YouTube channel. She goes by some Coco Chanel type name on Twitter. It starts uh, attacking my, me, saying I don't know IP law. Oh, tweet out the link. Okay, good idea. Hold on. Let me do that. Um, tweeting out the link. Hold on a second. All right, I just tweeted it. Okay. I guess you can just, guys, just text your any questions and I'll try to answer them. Um, so, and then she said he won't debate me because he never debates. Of course, so she hasn't done anything. She hasn't read anything cause, about my stuff because she'd know that um, – she'd know that I debate all the time. And uh, so she says she's read my stuff, but I think she's just lying. And um, so then she accused me of being mean because I answered her bluntly after she started with this – these uh, scurrilous attacks and uh, – I, I, I re-listened. I had heard before her, her, her little inane comments on the other YouTube video. I'll post a link early, uh, later um, arguing for IP. She's just doing the same old thing that lawyers do. She's saying, oh, the law does this, the law does that, and she's, she's using emotion. Oh, I feel – I feel that it's stealing if you copy someone's stuff. You know, She repeats the same old crap like, um, oh, if you put time and effort into something, then you should have a right to stop people from copying it. You know, that's just the Marxist labor theory of value argument, you know, uh, this idea that you have some kind of right to a profit if you spend effort, which of course is nonsense because value is subjective. So I don't know what to say. Um, I'm always willing to debate people, and I would have been polite with her if she had just been polite. Um, yeah, no, I should have, I should have practiced this. Is there anyone out there who knows how to do this right? I could go off real quick and start over. I mean, why is it so complicated? It wants me to get some kind of streaming software or something. Um, anyway, why don't you guys ask any questions if you have? I mean, all my arguments for IP are well known and out there already. So I don't know if I should repeat them here. I would have grilled her on what her arguments for IP, but she didn't want to do it. Um, anyone? No, she didn't show up. And plus, I don't know how to add anyone anyway, so I guess I screwed it up. Well, I don't think she came in. Okay, you say there's no good arguments for IP. What's the best argument that you've come across? Um... Honestly, just there are none. It's like it's like saying, what's the best argument for the drug war? I, I guess for the drug war, there's some arguments. People shouldn't do drugs, and it's harmful if they do it, and they, they're, they're more likely to harm themselves if they do drugs. It's not a good argument. It's not a libertarian argument, but it's coherent. Um, I suppose the best argument is if you create something, you own it, but that's a mistake because creation is not a source of rights, as I explained many times. And then there's other arguments that we're better off with IP law. But even that's not a good argument because you could never know that. And number two, that's not the purpose of law to make us better off, right? Just by going in and tweaking and intervening in the free market to fix market failures. So there really are no good arguments for IP. Um, every one of them I've heard is completely dishonest or, or, or flawed based upon extremely flawed, flawed premises. Why the Libertarian Party should adopt an anti-IP plank? Well, if you if you take take for granted that um, that IP is clearly unlibertarian and very harmful to the human race, which I think it is, uh, and uh, then it should be in the plank because the primary purpose of the Libertarian Party is to um, is to clarify and announce our principles and to educate people about them. So it's not to win elections because we're never going to win elections. 
It's only about to educate. That's why if you water down our principles to, and sell out to, to try to get someone elected somewhere that's not trivial, then what good are you doing? Um, so you have to stay principled even if it costs votes because we're not going to win anyway. Yeah, I'd debate your, your own, Brooke. I would debate um, probably the three – I won't say strongest, but the three people that would try to cobble together some kind of argument would be Richard Epstein, Adam Mossoff, and maybe your own, Brooke. Um, Mossoff and Brooke would argue from Randian premises, which I disagree with, but I think if they're civil and reasonable, we could discuss why I think they're wrong and why even Rand herself was self-inconsistent and some of her views contradict her pro-IP views. So I would take Rand 1 against Rand 2, so to speak. Um, and Richard Epstein is a utilitarian. That would be slightly harder to argue against because his entire political philosophy is Chicago – utilitarian based and he'll never change his mind on that so he thinks that the, the job of the government is to identify market failures and free rider problems and holdout problems and to intervene to harm some people a little bit to benefit everyone else more than that and to take some of that surplus and to reward the people or to compensate the people that were harmed that's his takings book so i'm sure he would uh, apply that to intellectual property although according to his takings book he says that the burden of proof is on those arguing for a government intervention. You have to demonstrate that the pie gets bigger so that there's a surplus left to compensate the people that were expropriated. And there is just simply no empirical evidence to show that IP law that he favors it grows the pie. So even by his own takings rubric, you can't justify IP law. And I doubt he would admit that, but I'd be happy to talk to him. I don't think any of them would talk to me. Um, Randians wouldn't talk to me because uh, they'd be sanctioning the sanctioner or something or because they'd be embarrassed or they don't want to talk to an anarchist or something. I don't know. Epstein, um, uh, I've met him before. I spoke at a thing he moderated before on IP, um, but I think he probably would not debate me on this topic. Um, he probably thinks it's beneath him, but I could be wrong. I should do – what I should do is uh, Gene Epstein should should have a IP debate on the Soho Forum, and I'd be happy to do that. He'd have to find a worthy opponent, and there just aren't any. So the only two that have any kind of coherence at all would be uh, some ra prominent Randian like um, Yaron Brook or um, Mossoff or, or Richard Epstein. Okay. Any more chats? Let's see here. Well, I might have missed some. I'll try to see. The, all right. The most plausible defense I've heard is that it incentivizes innovation. Oh, why do these chats go away? Innovation for otherwise expensive research projects. Um, yeah, so that's the pharmaceutical argument. And so a lot of people that are skeptical about IP, they'll say, well, the strongest case for IP is in pharmaceuticals. I actually think it's the opposite. I think the the strongest case for IP abolition is pharmaceuticals because pharmaceuticals are life-saving and important to life, and anything that impedes innovation um, is bad, especially in important fields. So I would say pharmaceuticals are the strongest case to abolish patents. Um, the argument that there's a lot of research costs is just not an argument because every entrepreneur faces costs and the cost of competition, and they have to take that into account in their business plan. Um, and one reason the cost that pharmaceutical companies face is so high is because of FDA regulations and taxes and other government regulations. Um, so that would be the way, main way to solve that problem. I haven't read much. I've read a little bit by Besson, uh, Besson and Muir. Uh, the patent failure comment you're talking about. Um, if I recall, I, I don't remember. I don't think there's that much principled and solid in their stuff. Uh, wait, I could be wrong. I think I have a, a blog post. Uh, Besson and Muir Duke. They are they are pretty strongly anti-patent. I'm sorry, that's right. I don't know. If, I think they have a more utilitarian case, but I think they are pretty strongly against it. And they, I think they conclude that there is no solid empirical evidence that patents do what the proponents claim that it does. Um, I'd say the strongest case from the utilitarian side is from um, Boldrin and Levine, and they're against intellectual pro monopoly. But even those those cases are always flawed because um, 
well, number one, that even they, as strong as they are against patents, they say that, well, maybe instead of having patents, the government should just subsidize basic scientific research or something like that. So they all see that there's a market failure. They just want to solve it in a different way with more government intervention. Um, I think they're also for trademarks, which I, I think they're wrong about. Um, and some of their arguments, I think their conclusions are right, but some of their arguments are flawed because, for example, um, um, like they argue that Italy and Switzerland had no patents on pharmaceuticals for a good 30, 40, 50 year period in the late 1800s, 1900s, and they were among the powerhouses of pharmaceutical production. But the problem with that argument is that you know, they were still selling presumably into other markets where there were patents like the U.S. So they could still, I guess, benefit from the patent system, giving them a monopoly price to subsidize their cost. So you can't really argue that those are counterexamples um, just because they didn't have patents. But I think that may be because they don't quite understand how the patent system works because it's very arcane and really only patent lawyers understand it. So there's a few mistakes like that, um, which, by the way, none of the IP proponents have pointed out because they don't even understand IP. Um, I haven't pointed it out explicitly because I'm not in a mood to weaken their case, but it's not the strongest argument. Oh, dull geek. Are you saying that Besson and Muir? Let me see if I can find their quote. Say that patents are not are good for pharma, but not for software. Um, let's see. I'll see for sif.org on my against IP page. I have a post about the empirical case against patent and copyright. Let me see what Besson and Muir say here. No, they say that. On average, the patent system discourages innovation. It seems unlikely that patents today are an effective policy instrument to encourage innovation overall and that patents place a drag on innovation. On innovation. Um, there's clear empirical evidence that the patent system is broken. So I don't know. Maybe they make an exception elsewhere in their in their paper um, or in their writing about for pharmaceuticals. But in the, the quotes I found from them, um, they're pretty strong about – the patent system not having – there's no empirical evidence to show that it's, it does what it claims to do. But the, ba the basic argument is that – the libertarian rebuttal to all this anyway is that the purpose of the state and law or the purpose of law is not to make sure there's an optimal amount of innovation in society. I mean you could have any number of goals that are, that are outside or apart from um, the goal of liberty or the goal of protecting individual rights. Um, like as Robert Nozick explains in his book, the, the essence of libertarianism is the belief in rights, and rights are what he calls side constraints. Like you just – you can't trump a right. The way everyone else thinks about things, it's all a big balance. There are many values we pursue in society. Conservatives believe this and liberals believe this. They all believe this. Um, so yeah, individual liberty and life and prosperity are one value. But it's not the only value. After all, we're not monomaniacs like you libertarians who think liberty is the only value, which is not true either. We value many things as human beings. It's just as libertarians, we think that it's unjust to commit aggression. Okay. So what they're what they're what they're anyone who favors considering other values in their balancing formula for laws that we can have other than liberty, what they're saying is I'm against I'm against aggression usually. But not always. So basically they're saying they're sometimes in favor of aggression because other values justify it. But that's just the same old argument for murder or tyranny or genocide or the drug war. Yeah, usually I'm against putting people in cages, but in this case we have the value of stopping the drug, uh, the use of drugs. That's so important that we can violate the value of liberty. So your only value politically can be aggression, non-aggression that is, opposing aggression. That's a side constraint. Um, which is why the value – the goal of a law cannot be to maximize innovation. However, if that was your goal, I would say the way you maximize innovation is to have a free society, free people that are, have free minds, and they have the wealth that comes from a free, uh, from a, uh, a free market and capitalism that's supported by a property rights system. So you have to identify and define property rights, respect them, and then people will innovate as much as is humanly possible within that system. 
You don't need to artificially support it. Yeah, I'm taking – I'll take second questions, FEMA. Um, do you make similar arguments against IP when you argue against copyright? God damn it. Why do these things disappear? Hold on. And trademarks, and how would you differentiate them? Well, what happened is these are all separate legal systems. They arose for different reasons, and when some of them came under attack by free market economists in the 1800s, um, the, the, the pro-IP interests that had been dependent upon them started defending them, and they said they're not monopoly privileges. They're, they're intellectual property rights, so they came up with this term intellectual property and they group under it all these different types of of um of rights like trademark patent copyright trade secrets because they all have to do with the creations of the mind is, is the reasoning but they work in different ways so the arguments for them are all are, are, are somewhat different and the arguments against them are somewhat different so copyright and patent are both very similar in that they both can be viewed as negative servitudes that's that is the owner or the holder of the patent or the copyright um, has a negative servitude or a negative easement over other people's property, which means they can use those rights to stop people from using their own property like they want to. And the, the reason that's unjust is because the negative servitude was not granted consensually by the owner of the, what's called the burdened estate. If you grant it by contract, it's fine. That's what restrictive covenants are in neighborhood associations. Uh, like when you're not permit, permitted to uh, use your home for commercial purposes because all your neighbors have this negative servitude or this veto right because you gave it to them, and they gave you one for their house. Um, but the government, in the case of patent and copyright, just takes it and gives it to people. Um, so it's just a taking of your property. Trademark is a little bit different. It's, it's more similar to defamation law. It basically tries to establish a reputation right. Um, everyone thinks that trademark is about protecting the consumer from fraud, but it's not because it doesn't require a showing of fraud. It only requires a showing of likelihood of consumer confusion, and consumer confusion is not the same as fraud, and a likelihood of it is not a showing that it's happening anyway. And furthermore, the trademark system gives the right to sue to the trademark holder, not to the defrauded consumer. So everything about trademark that people claim is based upon fraud is not true. Trademark really just protects the right of – the reputational rights of a company in the value of a trademark or a brand name that they've developed in the market. So it's very similar to what defamation law does. It protects your reputation, um, and it's unjust for that reason. The best argument oh, – argumentation ethics question. Oh, someone says, why does Against IP have a copyright from the Mises Institute? Um, well, the short answer is it's a mistake. Um, it doesn't have a copyright. It just has a notice, which is mistaken. Uh, they put it on there without my permission. They didn't understand, um, and uh, it's just false. They don't have a copyright. I have the copyright because I wrote it, and I've released it in the public domain. So that was just a mistake. I, I'm not really blaming them because this was early on before – I started ringing the alarm bells loudly about all this, but um, um, copyright law, like all types of statutory law, is very arcane, and people just don't understand it. Um, so people think that you can put a copyright on something because you have permission to publish it. That's not true. You have to own the copyright to do that, um, and the only way you own it is if someone signs a writing, a written assignment, which I never did. So it's just a mistake. Oh, someone asked me about my comment on mutualists. Oh, yeah, I have a long blog post about what I disagree with in mutualism, um, but there's aspects of at least the idea of mutualism as I understand it. Um, um, which is the idea that – well, look, when we live in society, you have certain rights, but you don't have a right to have those rights enforced. Like you don't have a right to, to have your neighbors help you enforce your rights. But in any workable system, you're going to need their assistance. So you're – like if you have a jury trial, you're going to need your neighbors to voluntarily uh, show up as witnesses and show up as jurors and help you enforce the, the sentence to be carried out. So there has to be a sort of give and take there, and if you abuse the system, if you're suing people left and right for $5 offenses all the time, people are just going to ignore you because you're, you're not worth their time. Um, so that part of mutualism I think 
and 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 there's there's something in the fact that we live in a world there are some uncertainty in some gray areas, so we have to be willing to compromise. We have to be willing to be reasonable. We have to be willing to submit disputes to third parties and accept the judgment even if we don't agree. We have to be willing to do all those things because the alternative is just violent conflict, which is the primary thing we're supposed to avoid. Now, where the mutualists are wrong is they basically want to accept the Marxian notion of exploitation, which is completely flawed on Austrian grounds. But it's the idea that if you're an empl if you're the employee of an employer, then um, the, the labor you put into the effort to, to, to make the products for your employer um, is the source of the value. So when the, when the employer sells the products that you make, the profit that they make is really due to – attributable to the work that the, the employee put into it. So if he's paid a salary but the employer makes a profit, if there's any profit at all, that profit is the surplus labor value which is being stolen from the employee. Now, of course, that's complete nonsense, but because they don't like employment um, and they don't like the idea of property – they don't like the idea of a band uh, – of, of um, what they call a distant – there's another word they term – distant ownership, something like that. Like um, if you're removed from the situation, you, you own you, – let's say you own a factory, but you're not there, or if you own um, an apartment complex where people live in it and you're not there. They basically think that these people, the, the employees own the factory because they're the ones using it, and they think that the tenants or the, 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 the people that live in your apartment complex can homestead it and own it. And of course this is just abolishing ownership and abolishing the distinction between possession and ownership. So what they're saying is possession is all that matters. So what they really favor is a might-makes-right world. You can, you can own something as long as you hold on to it, which means there's no such thing as ownership. Now, the, their argument to get out of that is they say that, well, we just are further down the spectrum than you on the idea of abandonment. So like I might say if you abandon your house and it grows over with weeds and you've been gone for 30 years, eventually some squatter is going to squat on it, and they might own it because you can be said to have abandoned it. And they say, well, we just believe the abandonment time period, instead of 30 years, it's, it's only a year or a month or something like that. So it's just a difference of degree, not of kind. That's what they argue. But that's a flawed argument because, um, um, because in the first case, the reason – we have to come up with this uh, – with this, um, with, with, with some kind of answer to the question, when does property become abandoned? When there's no explicit uh, uh, communication given by the owner, he disappears and we can't find the guy. So yeah, some societies might say one year, five years, 20 years that the land is declared to be abandoned at some point. Just like if someone's missing, you eventually declare them dead at a certain point or just like the age of consent is maybe 18 or 16 in different societies. Those are more spectrum or continuum issues, but they only arise when there is no… Knowledge of wh where the real owner is and what he really consents to. So if I leave my factory and it's down the road and I'm I'm taking the profits from it and I'm owning it and all my employees are running it for me, there's no doubt about where I am and I'm not abandoning it. If, in fact, I will say no, I I'm not abandoning it. So you don't get to the you don't get to the default issue. The, the you don't get to the point where you have to come up with a default rule to decide when we finally say the guy's gone forever and we have to declare the property abandoned. You don't get to that if you know where the guy is and he's saying he owns it and he visits it on occasion, sends his sends his guard his his security people over to to police it. Um, um, and furthermore, when you have a tenant living in your in your building or employees working in your building you have a contract with them where they basically are possessing your property on your behalf as your agent. So the mutualists have to abrogate contract rights. They have to ignore contracts between people, which is again what Robert Nozick says that you know we 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 libertarians believe in capitalist acts between consenting adults. Socialists ultimately don't, and mutualists don't, which is why they're partly socialist, in my view. Uh, all right, let me see what other chats I've missed. Property becomes abandoned if the owner doesn't remember the thing he left instead of time is based on memory. 
Um, possibly because if you lost your memory, you wouldn't complain when someone starts using it. Okay, Henry, Henry Sanders. We don't need property to explain the relation between an absentee owner and a factory manager. We could just say the current possessor, the factory manager, has a contract. Okay, keep going. I don't understand if you're agreeing or disagreeing with me, uh, Harry, so you can feel free to elaborate if you want. Um, I'm just simply explaining why I dis I have a long blog post about this on my, on my stephankinsella.com. Benjamin, do you attribute any value to economics or, or any other kind of utilitarian argumentation when making the case for libertarianism? Um, it's funny how this is turning into a general – yeah, I think, first of all, knowledge of economics is essential and especially Austrian economics, uh, just like knowledge of logic and having a, having a language. There's lots of disciplines that have to – and you have to know history as well. Um, this is why I reject the thickism idea. Like people, These libertarians just say, oh, well, we libertarians uh, have values other than liberty. Yeah, that's true, and we have to know things other than libertarianism. We have to know history, economics, math, you know, how to write, how to read, how to think, how to argue, how to be honest, how to be consistent. Uh, all these things complement each other, and they're necessary, but they're not the same. You know, um, we need doctors and dentists, but they're not the same thing. Um, but as for utilitarianism, I personally have never accepted the idea that there's a conflict or a dichotomy between um, consequentialism or pragmatism or, or good results um, or practicality and – Principles are the what's called the deontological approach. Um, I think the deontological approach is basically a principled way of looking at moral matters, which is essential because uh, moral matters are not empirical, factual matters. They are normative values and judgments and assertions and propositions that are always based upon some lower evaluation or value that we have. Um, so you, you basically deduce from – some presumed or given or shared values up, up the chain. But since we do have a similar human nature and we evolved a similar way, we all tend to have similar base values. And so it's not – no surprise that these tend to be practical, right? So honesty is practical, but it's also a principled uh, ethical value. Um, so I think consequentialism and um, the principal case for liberty – they complement and support each other. I don't th – even Ayn Rand said this. She said the, the practical – the moral is the practical. There's not a conflict between them. You don't have to choose between one or the other. Now, utilitarianism, I, I think, it depends on how you use the word. Um, and if you mean it in this uh, economic sense that you can measure value or utility in, in a cardinal way, I, I think that's wrong. But if you mean it if you use it to mean just a type of consequence – so I think consequentialism just means the consequences of actions matter, which is perfectly compatible with a moral or a principled view of things. And I would think of utilitarianism as a subset of consequentialism. Randy Barnett makes this point in the introduction to his book, The Structure of Liberty. So utilitarianism is problematic because of uh, if e economic concerns, number one, but consequentialism – is broadly speaking compatible, I think, with, with a principled or rights-based approach to liberty. Um, <laughs> LSU question. <laughs> uh, I think what's preferable is what happened is we had the best season imaginable, and it was worth paying the price that we're going to suck for a while because we probably would have sucked for, for a while anyway. But at least we had that amazing year. And I went to the game, by the way, and Trump was there. It was cool. Um, did I get into IP law because of my stance? Um, neither one. It's kind of a coincidence. I, um, I was always uh, curious about the IP argument in law school and in undergrad. Because it didn't make sense to me. It was one of these libertarian issues that I was having trouble with figuring out. But when I started practicing law and I finally went into patent and IP law for just for career reasons, um, I turned my attention more to it because I thought I had some extra uh, ability to understand it because now I understood the law. 
So as I started thinking about it, then I figured out pretty quickly, like basically the same year that I passed the patent bar in 94 is around the year I concluded, oh, IP is illegitimate. I was trying to, I was trying to come up with an argument to defend it for years, and I kept, I kept failing. And I finally realized why I was failing. I was trying to justify the unjustifiable. It's impossible to justify it. So once I switched my assumptions, everything made sense. Um, so I was cautious about announcing my views publicly at first because I thought it might hurt me in my career. But over time, I just said, I don't give a, I don't give a damn. And it never hurt me anyway. People don't care what your personal views are. It's just like who you vote for or um, what your religion is. People don't, as long as you know the law and you can do a good job, that's all they care about. Thoughts on Max Sterner and Arna? I don't. I have never read Sterner, so I, I can't comment on Sterner. If you had infinite knowledge about knock-on effects and ultimate steady state of laws, utilitarianism will boil down to yeah. I think that's right. Yeah, because the the purpose of law um, is to basically, I think, what are the common values that we all share as libertarians and as civilized, decent human beings? In a general way, we all want. We all want good for ourselves because we're all self-interested, but we also want everyone else to do well, and we want to live in a successful world where people are happy and flourishing and there's prosperity and that there's peace. We get along peacefully and cooperatively, and we trade instead of having violent conflict with each other. Now, there's a small percentage of society that is not like that. These are the sociopaths and the psychopaths. Uh, but by and large, we, we evolved as a social species to value um, cooperation, and we have empathy for each other, so we value each other's well-being. So if you take those base values, um, when the, because the world has scarcity, there's a possibility of conflict, violent conflict. And since we prefer peace, that is why we prefer property rules to assign owners in a fair way that allows us to avoid conflict. So property rules are consequentialist or pragmatic in the sense that they they solve the problem that we would have more of the things we don't want, which is violence and conflict if we didn't have property rules. So it's no surprise that consequentialism and pragmatism um, go together. That said, when you have difficult issues, we need to resort to principles, and we need to remember what our base principles are. We have to remember that we came up with the principles of non-aggression as the way to implement our revulsion for and loathing of, of interpersonal strife, conflict, and violence. So non-aggression has to be the touchstone. Um, so we can evaluate these claims about what laws are good or bad by going back to first principles. Someone says… I can set up a live stream with – oh, shit. I could have done Zoom too. I have, I have Zoom. I'm going to do that. Hold on a second. I'm going to do Zoom, and then I'll just put the link in here. I don't know what I was thinking because that woman wanted to be live streamed. That's the problem. I didn't want it to be live streamed. All right. Hold on. Zoom. Hold on. Let's just take a second, guys. Then everyone can talk. But All right. Let's continue with the questions. I think I missed some of the chats earlier. All right. Anyone got anything? Uh what would you say it, or can I go first? Go ahead. Uh, what would you say is the best argument you've heard against argumentation ethics and what and how would you say said argument falls apart? Oh no, I so unlike IP, I think there are good arguments against argumentation ethics. I understand why some people don't agree with it. Um, um, so one of them is that you can it can be taken too far. And Frank Van Dunn actually does this, and some of his defenses of, of argumentation ethics, like 90% of which I agree with and I like, but he, he goes too far. Like he even says, like, uh, you know, if you if you're arguing with someone and like say, let's say their son works for you and you threaten to fire his son from your job 
from his job if he you're, if the guy doesn't agree with you that that's not a legitimate argumentation tactic and therefore you can't be fired from your job for a bad reason so 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 like you see you could you can go too far with it i think and that's, uh, that yeah. sounds more like uh i don't know why but like that doesn't really uh debunk it more so it kind of shows that it goes to uncomfortable uh conclusions if you will um like i never really saw that as like a good argument against something like a uh, conclusion's a conclusion regardless of how you personally feel about it is what i what yeah. i'm trying to get at i agree it doesn't i don't agree with it but um uh I'm, and i guess another one would be maybe the strongest one is the idea that um, the ethics of argumentation only apply during argument, but not outside of argument. I think that's wrong too, but I understand that argument. So that what they say is any ethics that apply to things you do while you're arguing uh, don't apply once the argument's over. That one is confused and wrong, I think, but I understand why people make that argument. Also, I, I think you would be interested in this. Um, it's less a question and more. Um, are, so I was reading the other day about of this article. Is it or a PDF file? Um, it's this. It's a uh, page called um, "A Defense of Rothbardian Ethics Via a Mediation of Han of Hoppe and Rand," basically taking uh, Ayn Rand's. Um, objectivist teleological um ethical egoist ethics and sort of merging it with hans hoppe's argumentation ethics it's by a guy named cage share um you should check that out it's actually yeah, very yeah, very I, fascinating i i don't recall it if i don't but it sounds interesting yeah by the way did anyone here listen to that uh this woman nina's uh meandering thing about about ip you mean her tweets or did she come out and like say something no she had a youtube video for a few months ago which i posted a link earlier i don't i didn't know if anyone had i just posted it at the last minute so i don't know if anyone had a chance to um look at it i didn't know so she has so many different alt identities on twitter i didn't know that she had posted one um but i've been in just trying to have a discussion with her about ip for I don't know, a couple of weeks now. And I didn't realize that I was having the same discussion with three different, I thought I was having the same discussion with three different people all end up, ended up being the same person. Um, and so like, I, I, I have never gotten to the point where she's actually made an argument. I will go look up that YouTube video though. Mostly she um, just calls you a hack. Well, I, I don't understand, I mean, I just don't believe she's read my stuff because she she doesn't uh, engage with it. Um, so, I, you know, I don't care if she thinks I'm a hack, but I mean, what's what's her argument? You know, her argument is yeah, that exactly. I, I feel exactly. that it's theft. I feel that it's theft. I feel that it's wrong. That's that's exactly I, I find uh, I have not gotten any actual substance substantive ar argument out of her at all. Yeah. Well, you know, I, she's irrelevant, but um, I, I guess it, you know, maybe some of you guys will tell, we'll do it again if she'd be on. I, I'm happy to, look, I just hate debate formats because you speak for three minutes and they speak for three minutes and all this kind of stuff. It's ridiculous. Um, um, I ask a question, then they respond. I mean, it's better to have a give and take, a back and forth, um, I think. Well, I'm just trying to understand the arguments. Like I read your book and I found it convincing and I'm trying to understand the arguments against it. It seems pretty straightforward to me and it makes sense. And so when somebody came up and said, hey, this is completely wrong. Like, I wanna know why, I wanna know why it's wrong. Yeah. And also there are a few things in there. I mean, I wrote that 20 years ago, I, I do plan to, to update it and, and massage a few things. Uh, like I would use the word rivalrous more than scarcity now, just to, because people, 
equivocate on the word scarcity and they'll say, well, good ideas are scarce. So we use the word scarcity in a technical economic sense to mean rivalrous, basically. So if I said that, it would remove their ability to do that. Um, I was too soft on trademarks. Uh, and there's some additional arguments I've come up with in the last 20 years I'm, I need to add, but I don't really disagree with anything in it. Anyone? It, what are, yeah, what are your... Oh, that was a kid. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the animal rights issue? Because uh, I saw the Walter Block and some other guy uh, debate and I, and I thought like Walter Block's argument were really uh, not that good. I, I'm more of a Randian on this. I, I don't believe animals have rights, um, primarily because animals can't respect our rights. So there can't be sort of an, there's sort of an agreement or again, the mutualist thing. There's, a, there's, an, there's an agreement here where we acknowledge each other's potential to harm each other and to use our resources, but we all agree on a certain set of property rules um, so that we can avoid conflict with each other and cooperate and trade with each other. And I think that just requires a certain amount of, of ability to communicate and rationality and animals just don't have that. doesn't mean it's, it's, it's not immoral to torture or even to kill animals as an ethical matter, but I think, I think rights should, arise should from, from if you can rationality. Be on, if you don't feel too sick. Not now. Yeah, Hey, hey, Jack, will you please mute your mic? Someone needs to mute. Yeah, it's Jack. I think he's going to kill him. Yeah. Basically, remove him. There. I just muted Jack. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Um, but could you name the trait? Like, what's true for animals that if true for humans, it could be right, it would be right to kill humans. Like, if you say intelligence, uh, a person less intelligent than me, I could kill them. If you, say, if you say it's natural, if it were natural to eat humans, it would be okay. That That's name the trait. Well, I mean, I think if an animal kills a human, it's not wrong and it's not murder. Um, the whole purpose of rights is that we can agree to respect each other's rights and you know discuss things rationally. Now, if you're saying, does that logic mean that certain people can be killed because they're, I don't know, they're 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 retarded or they're infants or they're old and in a coma? Um, I guess you could argue that, but it's an I think those are edge cases. I mean, there's a book that influenced me early on by Lauren Lemaski, which many people haven't read. It's called Persons, Rights, and the Moral Community. Now, he's not an anarchist, but he's a good libertarian. And he's got this argument, he calls it piggybacking, where it's almost like a contractualist view that in society, we have rights because we're all rational beings. And for the people that are marginal, we attribute rights to them because they're almost human, or they were human, or they're on the stage of becoming human. They sort of they get the benefit of the doubt, so to speak. Um, I think that's probably the most reasonable way to approach it. I mean, I don't know what else you can do. You could, I guess you could ask God to give us a commandment and tell us, but uh, if we're figuring out things with reason and rationality, and these are the rules that we reasonable, rational people that communicate and interact with each other have come up with, it doesn't automatically easily apply to people that are helpless. Um, so we have to come up with some civilized rule to, to treat with them. Yeah, but I don't see why those rules could apply to animals. Like it's that human that could that couldn't that could never uh, argument or logically think or whatever, like an animal. And you know he, he can't, and you say it's a human, but yeah, but how do you define how do you define human? Like it's her gens. Well, he might do a, he could do a, a gen test and he's not a human, like. Well, I, I wouldn't the, say, I, I, I wouldn't say only humans have rights. I would just say we're, humans are the only animals we know of that have rationality. So any, any, any animal that had um, what we call sapient, right, would have rights. Um, 
so if the dolphins evolved into intelligence or an alien species landed, we would all have rights with respect to each other because we could communicate and agree to cooperate with each other. Um, but I guess the question for you would be why restrict it to animals? Uh, I mean, why would only animals have rights? What about, what about planets or rocks or molecules, right? Or, or plants, Wh why animals? Yeah, sure. Because they they could uh, they are sentient. They are sentient. Okay, so sentience, but and really, I think that argument comes down to the pain argument. Like they can feel pain, and it's wrong to inflict pain. Something like that. What about insects? Uh, there's no evidence for the insects being sentient, so I am agnostic on this topic. So if, if a creature is aware of its existence, in some sense, you say it's wrong to to end that. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess one problem with that argument is that what about the animals themselves out in the jungle between the animals? They're all killing each other all the time. So are they immoral? Hey, I think we should kill the, the, the predators. Sure. Well, but I mean, half the, but the world is, I mean, half the animal kingdom is predators. And if you kill them, then you would ruin the whole ecosystem. I mean. Wait, 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 wait. Are you utilitarian? No. No, I just think I just think that. Uh, so your goal would be a, a world of docile, peaceful, vegetarian creatures that there's no there's no there's no predators. There's only prey, or there's only only peaceful animals. Uh, yeah, sure. That's kind of my goal. <laughs> I think um, it's in a, in a, in a hypothetical. Yeah, sure. Within the know. animal kingdom, there's a lot of quote unquote friendly and they're at who, the animals that aren't actually friendly. I, I've been to a I've been to a zoo when I was younger. I, I know that for I know that from personal experience that a lot of these uh, was it herbivores that eat plants only? Uh, yeah, herbivores, omnivores, omnivores. Yeah, herbivores. Uh, a lot of herb herbivores are just as violent if not more violent than a lot of omnivores and carnivores yeah we, sh we should apply okay. this to humans like if you violate others rights then you could violate his rights i i, I remember there was a there was a, a q, q a session with leonard peacock one time years ago and someone asked this animal rights thing and by the way, Ayn Rand's lawyer, Henry Mark Holzer, who was kind of libertarian, he, he came out in favor of animal rights himself later. Um, <laughs> but uh, he wrote a great book called Sweet Land of Liberty about the Constitution, but he's also an animal rights kind of guy. But um, someone asked Peekoff about animals' rights, and, and something about the mosquitoes came up, and he said, well, the mosquitoes can have rights when they petition for them. In other words, if someone asks you to respect their rights, I guess you should respect it. But animals don't ask us to respect their rights. I, I don't, I do not believe in animal rights. Although I would say I sort of accept them, accept them as kind of like a rule of thumb. If you, if you know what I mean, you get what I'm trying to yeah, say. You say a, a positive right. Yeah, well, you could say that. I, I am sympathetic to the argument that if we come up with um synthetic meat which i think we will eventually that at that point there will be very very little moral excuse for killing animals for food um for medical experimentation is a different issue but uh, for for food yeah i, I think then, then you would have a hard time justifying hunting and and farming and killing animals because you could get just as good meat from a, from a lab well i mean that's uh, that's like saying uh there's going to be a point in which we don't need to steal from the rich to give to the poor. So therefore in that case, it will, it will it only be moral? Like well, morality that, should be like always. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not, but I don't think animals have rights. If it was a rights thing, it would be, yeah, we can't do it at all. But I'm talking about the, the morality. You could say that there are different factors. Like if it's survival, um, you're not violating the rights because they don't have rights, but if we need animal food to live, which I guess you could argue we don't because some people are vegetarians. Um, oh, and it's even healthier to be a vegan or vegetarian than a carnivore. 
this is this I mean, is not what they, this is not what I'm hearing from the from the Bitcoiners that they, they think that red meat only is the only thing you should eat. So I don't know. Who knows? I don't know what to believe. Show the evidence. <laughs> ask ask them to, to to prove it. They claim to have it, but I, I don't know. I, it's not my bag. I don't, yeah, so and I could say and I could say I'm God and I had the proofs of it, but I don't I don't show I don't show it to you. I would argue God is already on this meeting. I, I, I'm kind of curious about the animal thing. If, like, <laughs> if if some like elk say were to were to damage another deer, how would you give restitution to the deer? Pardon, could you repeat, please? Yeah, sure. So, how would you give restitution to like a, a victimized animal if a if a predator were to say, or even not even a predator, but something were to hurt it in some regard that isn't killing it? Uh, how do you how would you do it to humans how well i mean would you do it to humans? monetarily i mean whatever that that human were to want right or whatever you know when some kind of arbitration process between that human and the person that hurt them yeah okay that's but kind an of animal problem. can't think or yeah. reason <laughs> yeah that's kind of a problem but if if we have a person that can't think and uh, cause any problem to another human. How a human? How how could you resolve that? You mean if an animal hurt a human? No, no, no. A human who can't think because he's retarded or whatever. Ah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that, that that's a little bit more of a border case. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I would say that that if if there's a human that's so incapacitated, he harms people he's not really responsible because it's not really an action. It's just behavior, right? Now you can use force to defend yourself from that and then, and stop it, but you don't treat them as a responsible agent if they're not doing it consciously. Just like animals, we don't regard animals as evil for trying to hurt us. But we- Hey, uh, Stefan, have you yeah. ever uh, uh, considered it in the context of like your essay, how we come to own ourselves? And that you can only one person can possess their own body and you can't be in possession of another person's body. Um, how does that work for animals? Because how can you possess or own animals? Because only the animal can be in direct control of their own body, right? Doesn't that sort of make sense, that argument? Yeah, so that so one problem I had with like Rothbard's the way he argued against voluntary slavery contracts is he says that um, your will is inalienable. And so a contract is null and void because your will is inalienable. But the problem is Rothbard believes, and so do I, that sometimes you can use force against another person like in self-defense. But in that case, the person you're using force against has free will. He still has his will. But what you're doing is you're overriding his will with force. So the, the, fact of, the fact that you're the direct controller of your body doesn't mean that you always own it. It means you're the presumptive owner when there's a question about who owns it. Um, but you can lose that right, right by committing an act of aggression. So it's just the answer to the question when rational people get together and they, they, want, they have the question, who has the best connection to that body? The, the default answer is the person who controls it. But the question doesn't arise for animals because <laughs> they're not part of argumentation. They can't – they're not petitioning for their rights. I mean look, this is, this is the, the libertarian view, which is about rights of, 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 of sapient creatures, which is humans, the only ones. Um, if you believe in animal rights, then the whole thing is, is different, and I just, I just don't. But does that make sense? So in other words, the fact that someone has- Yes, yes, that does make sense. Doesn't mean that you can't use force to override it. So when we control an animal, we take into account its nature. I mean, the word animal means something that can move, right? So unlike other objects in the world, it moves on its own. That's the nature of it. In fact, you know, the ownership of cows, they, we know they're going to roam around. So we own them by branding them so that there's a sign placed on them. You own things according to their nature, and if they're movable things, they, they move around on their own. The way you control them is by coercion, basically, or, or by 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 um, 
pinning them somewhere where they can't escape. But the way you control a prisoner is you coerce them, right? Or the way you control someone trying to hurt you is by coercion. Um, can animals act in a Misesian sense? I don't think so, because um, in the Misesian sense, and that's why he called it human action, I guess. Um, action means to have a purpose in mind. I mean, I guess in a crude sense, they do, right? In a crude sense, they do. They have a goal and they, like, gorillas, you know, if he wants a banana, he'll climb on the bales of, he'll climb on the tree to climb up and get it and he'll peel it to eat the fruit inside. So he, he uses means to achieve ends. So I, I guess you could say they act. It's just on a less conscious or different level than, than humans. Uh, Stefan, can I, can I uh, tell you about something that kind of, uh, I, I don't know what words to use, pissed me off or sort of like baffled me, but um, basically I was in a discord argument with a socialist and we were uh, discussing morality and you're aware of sort of like the um, common refutation that uh, we give we give to the sort of idea of uh, what's it called again that <clears throat> well we humans can't own each other because well we would have to get permission from seven billion yeah. people to do that all that stuff and it would be literally impossible to do that thus rendering it a non a not moral system. I presented that to him and he straight up just said, well, that would mean that humans are fundamentally immoral because we can't live up to the one true morality. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, how do I respond to this guy? <laughs> I mean, okay, how, how do I respond to this guy? It's like saying like, like I for I, I basically fun. I don't know where I read or I was reading a, uh, pdf for uh ba more basics of uh morality and something about like ought implies that you can do something and then right. i sort of and then he 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 completely threw that out of the window and he just straight up said well if humans can't do it then that means we're fundamentally immoral beings <laughs> yeah well, like, i mean what the hell they're they're he's basically <laughs> confirming the the criticism <laughs> that socialists effectively are for, they're not for human life. I mean, some of these people are explicit. They, they want a world where humans have been killed because they think we're evil, right? I mean, that's what the VHIMP movement, the voluntary human <clears throat> extinction movement. Um, yeah, and I find the same kind of critic, the same kind of problems in the works of Immanuel Kant. I, I think that his, uh, that the, um, this could be the objectivism talking because I used to be an objectivist and I still hold a lot of the things like I, like I uh, supplement ethical egoism with argumentation ethics and whatnot. Um, I find sort of like Immanuel Kant's uh, categorical imperative to be too rigid to be workable in sort of like a we can't actually we can't actually take that seriously without falling into the kind of problems that Rothbard found yeah um I mean I guess at a certain point I think if you want to be objectivist Leonard Peikoff says like in Opar what do you do when someone's stubbornly irrational and they just they keep you keep pointing things out to them they say well so what but this, you finally just have to you have to walk away because you're talking to someone stubbornly irrational or that has values so antithetical to ours that there's nothing to be gained by by you just have to I, I'd say like Hoppe says treat them as a technical problem just keep an eye on them <laughs> I just when that happens I just troll them and make fun of them until they cry until they cry to their moms or something I don't know but like at that point you just troll them until they leave Let's see, someone else here in the chat, someone says, have I seen Mises Institute Turkey? I don't recall learning anything about them. I do go to Turkey every year for the Hoppe thing. I'm going this September. I would think there'd be some overlap. Maybe it's just getting off the ground. Uh, this is Bay Rekor. Uh, if you want to explain what you're talking about, I'd be happy to field it, but I don't know much about Mises Turkey. Someone says- hey, Stefan, yeah, yeah. I have a, a quick question for you. So 
can't, um, why can't we just dispense uh, with the notion of property and just have possession and contract? Isn't that enough to explain everything? For example, well, um, any possessor, any, for example, you loan out anything that's just a contract, kind of contract, correct? You could explain it with contract. Couldn't you theoretically explain everything with just possession and contract? Well, I, the way I think of contract is is subsidiary to property. So when, you, when you're an owner of a resource, that means you have the right to use it or the right to possess it. Um, and you can use that. And what it means to have a right to use something is really, it's not a right to use it. It's a right to exclude people. So it means you can deny people permission to use that thing. Um, it doesn't mean possession because that's just the ability to use it. So it's the right to, they have to get your permission. And the reason you have contracts is because it's just the exercise of ownership. So you're saying, okay, I'm giving you permission to use this thing. That's right. what a contract is. When you that's give someone is. permission, and then when you give someone permission, that's a sort of, that could just be a kind of contract, right? So you're the possessor, and then it's just a special kind of contract that you have. Oh, you can be the possessor under these stipulations that whenever I say I can have possession back. Or but, something like that. But if you don't if you don't own the resource, they don't need your permission. So the contract wouldn't have any effect. So I I give you my car and I say I'm going to loan you my car for a week, but you have to return it. But if I don't own the car, as soon as you get it, now you're possessing the car. You don't have to return it. So the contract. Well, you do because else you break the. Well, no, because a contract is just a title transfer, right? Yeah, uh, under of some, of something that is, well, it's title of something that you own. But if you if there's just possession, you're not transferring. You're just handing manually possession. But once they have the possession of it, they don't need your permission anymore. It only makes sense if you own the resource, because if I own the resource and you don't return it at the end of the term, now you're stealing something that I I own. You can't you can't say I'm doing anything anything wrong unless I'm still the owner. The breach of the contract follows from ownership. You would be violating the contract, right? If a contract because don't have any you are, meaning, you're thinking of a contract as a binding promise, which is what Rothbard right. You argued. agree to give the car, you give the the possession of the car back, and you broke the contract, right? Contract contracts are not binding agreements, so they're they're just transfers of title to property. So, in other words, if you don't have ownership. Contracts are not what Rothbard said they are. They're not transfers of title because there's no such thing as title. There's no such thing as ownership, right? That's what you just said. We have possession, not ownership. Right. So if you have possession, no, I not see what you're saying. Now, there is something in the law. So in the law, there's something called the right to possess, which I never get into because it, it's confusing to, to laymen. But um, so there's three things, really. I, in my writing, I usually talk about possession, which is a factual thing. That's how Mises talks about it. There's the factual authority over a thing, and then there's the legal, right? So juristic and prescriptive and descriptive, right? Normative or juristic and, and causal and descriptive or factual. But there's really three things in the law. There's, there's actual possession, which is the ability to control something, which even right, Robinson Crusoe on Desert Island has. And then there's ownership, which is the right to own something, which means that if someone possesses it and you still own it, you can get it back from them using the legal process. But in, in between those, there's something called the right to possess, which is more of a procedural thing, which is like, let's suppose you own a house and uh, someone kicks you out of the house. You can sue to get them ejected by saying you're the owner. But you could also sue to put, kick them out because they, they, they disturbed your possession of it. But that could work also if you're not the owner. So let's say that I go on vacation for a year and I come back and there's someone in my house. Um, they, they might be presumed to have the right to possess until you prove you're the owner. So until you prove that, they have a right to possess. And if I physically kick them out, the law might put them back in possession of it until we resolve the ownership issue. So there's a sort of intermediate thing, which I think I'm bringing this up because I think that what you're describing and what the mutualists talk about is really more what they believe in. It's not quite fair to say they don't believe in property rights at all. They just think that the, the statute of this, the statute of limitations or the abandonment period 
is so the threshold is so low that it's a it's almost like it's might makes right and there's only possession but it's really more akin to the right to possess in the law but that's a kind of i don't know i never thought i think um yeah the uh owners the owner left the factory but the factory is not abandoned right it's I mean, that's abandoned. sort of like a misnomer. It's not, it's never, there's so always, there's people there working. That, that's if why they I said just that, agreed, they just have an agreement with the owner that, that they that's are. That's why I said, so the, the mutuals have to disregard freedom of contract, which means that effectively what you're doing is you're, you're telling someone, you can use my property under this condition, under the condition that um, any any rights that you would homestead from it if it was declared abandoned or something like that come to me you could it's the same thing for like let's suppose you have a a, a company and there's un, there's unowned wilderness out there and instead of you going out there and homesteading a farm you pay someone to go do it for you you pay your agent so he goes out there and he homesteads a farm i think the mutuals would have to say he owns it because he did it whereas the Rothbardian would say the employer owns it because he has a contract with the guy where the guy agrees to automatically and instantaneously transfer to the employer any property that he homesteads as soon as it happens. So it, that happens by contract. Let's see, we, we had, I had one question in the chat. Um, John Galt, I don't know if you're still here. Uh, he says, why can't ideas be homesteaded by creating a virtual or tangible representation of them? And that's kind of Rand's argument. The mistake there is everyone assumes that creation is a form of owner is a, is a source of property rights, but that's a that's a confused notion. The only sources of property rights are original appropriation and contract that's it so because you can't create things out of we don't really make things even on Rand said this we don't create things out of nothing we rearrange things with our intellect but when you rearrange something you have to have possession of it and if you want to own it you have to own the things that go into it so you can own the end result of a productive effort <laughs> if you own the input factors but you own them not because you created anything. You own them because you already owned what went into it. So like if I make a car out of my raw materials, I own the car, but I didn't create. So I created a car, but what that means is I produced the car. I rearranged materials that I owned into a, into a more useful configuration. So I own the output result because I own the input result. And by the same token, an employee on an assembly line working at the Ford Motor Company does not own the cars that he makes because he is rearranging material owned by someone else. So the source of ownership follows ownership of the input factors. So creation has never been a source of rights. We use our intellect to more efficiently and productively rearrange things, making them more valuable, which creates wealth. And we also use it to come up with ideas and knowledge. And that knowledge is useful because it helps guide our actions and make us more efficient in what we do. But you never owned these ideas in the first place because they're not scarce resources that can be owned. It's just knowledge in your head that guides what you do. It's nonsensical to talk about owning it because ownership is an enforceable right, a physical, enforces a physical thing that applies to, in fact, it, is, it solves the problem of conflict, which is violent conflict, which is physical force between two physical human beings with physical bodies fighting over the use of a physical thing that's a tool or a means of action that they both want to use. This is all physical, so it only applies to physical things. All laws only, you know, we libertarians forget sight of this, but we sometimes say that all laws are enforced at the point of a bullet ultimately, right? So ultimately, it's all about force. So force can only apply to physical things. Physical things are always what force applies to. So property rights are always in things that have a material body that can be affected by force. So when you have intellectual property law that says you own an idea, that's not really true. You cannot own an idea. It's impossible. It's just a disguised way of assigning the ownership of a, of a scarce resource, namely someone's factory or their printing press. 
it gives a partial right in that to the holder of the copyright, a negative servitude, as I said before. So it's always about rights in physical things. The question is, how do we assign those rights? And the libertarian and the private law answer is we assign them according to the two principles. First, first use of it when it's unowned, and then contractual transfer from a previous owner. That's basically all of libertarianism. The rest is details. What are your thoughts on the uh, kind of indigenous people uh, question here? In, oh, it sounds that sounds Nazi, but I mean, like uh, in Chile, there's a debate uh, over whether uh, we should give back or the state should give back uh, land to the Mapuche who lived in the south, and like uh, I, of course, disregard the, the the argument that it should be given to like the community or Mapuche society. But if someone can prove that he or his uh, ancestors uh, owned a certain piece of land, even if it's in the middle of a city, do you think they, they should be given that land? Yes. But however, I think in a free society, this wouldn't be a big problem. So what would happen is when you buy property, you want to make sure that your title is secure and that someone's not going to come along later and say it was stolen and all that. So what you would do is what happens now is you would get you would you would get property title insurance and that company would sell it to you. They would give you an insurance policy guaranteeing to pay you if you got kicked out later and to make sure they don't have to pay out often they would do a search and they would make sure it's got a clean title. Right? So I don't think it would be a real problem in reality. It's a problem now because we have the state and the state has messed everything up and they've made justice impossible. And they've created victims. So the result, if you don't give them restitution, it seems like a horrible violation. And if you do give them restitution, it seems horrible because you would ruin a big city. But this just means that when the state comes in, they fuck things up and they break things and they cause misery and damage. And they have done that. And the, mis the misery is there. It's just who's going to bear it. But I think ultimately the libertarian has to say, yes, if you can prove a claim, you should regain your property. It's just that it's harder to do as the claims get older and older because the records get lost, witnesses are all dead, the claims are not specific anymore. Um, but yeah, I think you can make a case. You can certainly make a case like I, I don't believe in uh, reparation for slavery and all this, except you could argue that the federal government is the inheritor of a criminal gang and it's in possession of a lot of property, like all the you know, millions of acres of wilderness in the U.S. Why not auction those off and pay, pay the, give the proceeds to victims of the state, including, including slaves or people in jail for drug crimes? Uh, on the question of the, the reparations, I was thinking, uh, of course, there's going to be a time when it's just too hard to find out who the actual, like, say, real owner is. But uh, in a way, it gets me thinking if, uh, uh, if we're deriving morality for our condition as humans, is there a point in which we have to say that uh, whenever it is Im humanly impossible to determine the actual owner or of the, uh, the actual uh, person with a title, uh, the actual right itself has changed? And the actual right depends on our human capacity to, to determine who, who has it. Like if someone used to own it, so an indigenous people, and 300 years later, it is simply impossible to determine whether he had it or not. Does that mean that it's not his right anymore? Or, is it, yeah. or, or, or the right is there, we just are always going to be ignoring it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think of rights as metaphysical things that exist in some platonic realm like that. Um, it's a practical solution to a problem. Um, and there are epistemic, epistemic issues to, um, to the, if, if something is totally unprovable, then what can be done? Because any, any, any realistic system of justice, you have to appeal to the community and ask for their, for their support on your claim. But if you can't prove it, you know, all this means is that crime is possible and injustice is possible.
I have a question for you. Um, oh, are you there? I, I think it froze. Oh. Hmm. If there was a free market in internet services providers, then um, are you aware of the libertarian anarcho-capitalist movement in Brazil? Yeah, hey, I've been to Brazil. we lost you for a sec. <clears throat> How about now? Yeah, you cut out. Really? Oh, yeah. I think, am I back now? Yeah, 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 yeah. you're back. I think my son opened the garage door and it, it messed up with my Wi-Fi. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, someone asked about the anarcho-capitalist movement in Brazil. Yeah, I've been there. I've spoken there. Um, I know it's, it's, it looks like one of the largest movements in the world, as far as I can tell. Very yeasty. Someone says, can AI have property rights? I think so. I just don't think AI is possible anytime soon. And yes, I do think it would own the computer it's running on. This is an argument I made with Walter Block one time, and this is similar to my argument for in, when I said, when do, how do we come to have rights? How do babies have rights? Yeah, I, it's not really by contract, although you can make some kind of argument along those lines. I think it's simply because the baby, when he wakes up and has rights, he has the best control over his body. So the mom owns the material of that fetus um, until we say that the baby has rights, and then she loses it. So if a computer network woke up, yeah. then the owner of that computer would lose rights to it, and the computer would now own that. I guess. <laughs> That's a hard one. Uh, but I don't believe in AI. Uh, I've never seen Doctor Who. Um, Anti-IP arguments, the existence of IP infringes the property rights of others. Yeah, that's exactly the problem with it. That's why I call it negative servitude. Uh, one of my high school, this is from Thomas, unless you want to say it here. One of your high school friends' dads has a that's library. That's an oh, extension oh. of the Doctor Who question. Oh, okay, sorry. I like sci-fi, but I just haven't seen Doctor Who. Um, I have a question for you, Stefan, um, Mr. Daniel. Um, have you are you familiar much with like the people they like to call themselves post libertarians, and um, they they look at a lot of like the Mentors Bull Bug and NRX kind of stuff. Um, yeah, read yeah, much I of them or understood it? I like, can't, I can't get them straight, but yeah, I'm neo reactionaries and all these guys. Yeah, there's, there's a group of libertarians that are kind of growing, like Matt Erickson, who's like got to show us J Jason Sevelton. It's like Andrew Guy, popular liberty on Twitter, talk about this kind of stuff. Nick where they're Land. Coming, yeah, I haven't read much of him, but um, I'm just trying to understand like where they're coming from because they talk about like maybe like engineering liberty, which seems kind of strange, but we'll also talk about how, you know, libertarians as humans, liberty is not our highest goal per se, but like as exactly. political liberty it is. But their kind of argument is like, well, we can engineer liberty by using the state. They seem very authoritarian. But, um, and they're also talking about the leftists a lot. And they'll be like, oh, the left will like destroy everything. We must like stop the left because they'll destroy our order and stuff, which is a little Hoppian sort of. Um, a lot of, I think, yeah, a lot Mildenburg of them were, was Hoppe highly like influenced by Hans Hoppe, even though he may have, at least in my opinion, misinterpreted some of the stuff that Hoppe wrote. Yeah. So I just kind of wanted to hear, Stefan, if you had any thoughts on the kind of that whole movement and stuff. But. I, I haven't been able to read it my eyes glaze over when most of them are very meandering and long-winded like yeah. Moldbug. I, th I think exactly. Moldbug is brilliant but i can't i can't follow it and he drops all these arcane terms and i don't have time to google 150 things every time i want to watch something uh, or read something um they don't ar they argue in this linear fashion instead of like systematically yeah i think ultimately they make the mistake that i mentioned before that liberals and conservatives do they they, they say that liberty is of value but it's just one of many values <clears throat> once you do that you give up libertarianism i don't think they're libertarians as far as i can tell they're kind of neo-fascists or they're almost strongmen nietzschean like uh, the strong will survive kind of guys a lot of them are pickup artists bullshit i mean it's a weird confluence of things right macho men shit they use the word cuck a lot i don't know i, I i'm turned off by all of it i have never learned anything <laughs> from these people um but i haven't read a lot in there either it's just it doesn't seem to me deep libertarian theory that I'm interested in. They, they don't have a lot of principles that I can tell that you can <clears throat> relate to them on. Yeah, the one uh, neo-reactionary uh, individual that I sort of, uh, I guess you could say like is uh, that Nick Land guy. Uh, he's sort of like a, uh, 
Well, he, he's not necessarily a neo-reactionary person, but his ideas certainly have influenced that school of thought. He is most known for something called accelerationism. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that is that like the worse is better idea? Like we need to go ahead and uh, it? No, it's a lot more complicated than that. He ta- Nick Land talks a lot about feedback loops and stuff. And I think a lot of it stretches back to a lot of stuff he was doing in the 90s he was he used to be a uh i don't know if he still is but he used to be a philosophy professor at this uh university or something down in the states but basically he uh used to be kind of like a lefty marxist person but yeah he had a lot of bizarre ideas which i think is due in part to the the fact that he was doing he was doing a lot of drugs back in the 90s like a lot of psychedelics and he talked he talked a lot about uh, how capitalism is no and i'm not joking when i say this that capitalism is an artificial intelligence from outside of space and time trying to seep its way into the the material world Uh, but since he's come off the drugs, he uh, in the mid two thousands he read Moldbug, then made a sharp turn straight to the right, and I have no idea what he's doing right now. But he's following me on Twitter for some reason. Um, I guess yeah, I, I have a few friends that have gone from libertarians with more of this kind of neo feudalist, uh, neo monarchist and feudalist stuff or monarchist stuff, and basically. What I noticed is they've dropped, they've dropped their opposition to aggression. Because if you ask them point blank, do you oppose aggression um, on principle? They'll, they'll deflect or evade or change the subject or they'll say, or they'll say no. Like sometimes you, they'll say, oh, or they'll, or they'll do that dishonest thing where they'll say, well, you need, to use, you need to use aggression to stop criminals, which of course is not aggression, right? So they try to equivocate. But they're not against aggression ultimately they, they, because – Peace is not their only value, right? Maybe having the white, a white continent is their value. I don't know. But I'm, I'm lumping these guys together because I don't really follow them that closely. Yeah. Back to Nick Nicola. Land could be best said to be a, some kind of ANCAP if I'm reading him correctly. I think he's an ANCAP. Well, I'll I don't just know. Start. I just kind of wonder how much of Papa is, is his fault. I don't know if it's his fault at all, but like, I guess you can take any reader and kind of take him to it. Because they'll we'll talk about low time preference and high time preference. And like, you know, we'll talk about that a lot. But like, they'll be like, you know, you're not taking this far enough. That's just this one guy, Andrew, Popular Liberty, who was talking to me about it. He was like, I'm just taking Papa's economics to its logical conclusion. And, you know, but then he's like, yeah, Stefan, you're right. Like, they don't really care about, you know, using state aggression or whatever they're just like well it's kind of necessary you know yeah i think that i I always get this nietzschean impulse from these guys um in a kind of scary way but um um i don't like i also don't i don't like to panic about these guys like like the like the sjw's do i mean the sjw's are probably even worse in their way but um all right someone just asked about bitcoin in el salvador I think it's a very positive thing. I'm not sure what the results would be. I don't think the U.S. is going to do anything about it. I don't think they care. I do think other countries will will do something similar. Um, the only thing the U.S. might do is they might modify the U.S. tax law to either to, to change how we treat foreign currency. Like there's some kind of tax advantages to U.S. citizens once a, a thing is called a foreign currency. So this could help Bitcoin use in the U.S. a little bit. And if the, if the U.S. doesn't like that, they might get rid of that. So they just might not respect it as a foreign currency. But I don't, I don't think they would do anything to El Salvador. But, I but could be wasn't wrong. it already adopted as a currency in Japan or something? As a legal think, tender in Japan or something? I don't know. I hear these exaggerated claims by libertarians, and I, can, I never get a direct link proving it like to the law. It probably was just legalized for some kinds of uses. Um, I don't see why El Salvador would be getting all this PR of the first country to adopt it if Japan had already done it. So I don't know, but I don't think it was done 
as legal tender. And I'm not even sure if El Salvador's law made it legal tender. That's what, how people are describing it. Um, El Salvador doesn't really have they, – they don't have money. They, have, they use the U.S. dollar. So I don't know some what it people, means. Some people are saying that – isn't that a little bit counterproductive because then you're – man the state is mandating the acceptance of bitcoin right whereas we don't want the state to mandate anything right well that's what legal tender law does i i'm just simply saying that if they declare it legal tender there it could help americans uh, using it here um yeah i'm against legal tender law of course um but that's why i'm skeptical that it really is like i'm skeptical that if you owe someone a debt in el salvador let's say you some some night some 80 year old shopkeeper you owe him a thousand dollars and you give him bitcoin and he doesn't know what the hell it is do you have to can he be forced to accept that i find it difficult to believe that the legal system in el salvador is going to force everyone to accept bitcoin in payment for debts but i guess i heard um, that they can immediately convert it i have one more follow-up with that i just um do you think it's a good uh, like uh competing currencies along with the dollar do you think that's a good stepping stone or do you would you think that's counterproductive because i could see like if you were to make other things legal tender for example um gold um as legal tender or silver as legal tender or something alongside the dollar just to compete with the dollar so therefore the dollar doesn't have monopoly well i think that anything that the u.s government could do to remove the tax capital gains tax status of bitcoin or gold would be good and if declaring it legal tender would achieve that that's good um although again i don't like people being forced to accept something in payment for a debt if they contract specifies some other means of payment but on the net the net result of such a law would be great and i don't think the u.s government would ever do it because they want to tax these I have also, but in the okay. Constitution, doesn't it say Thank only you. gold is legal tender? So how, mm. why is it, I guess, what was the, uh, how did we get to the paper money thing if the Constitution, spe- doesn't it specifically say that only gold is legal tender? I, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. I think it says that, um, I think it gives Congress the power to make, to, to, to coin money. So that means that they can, out they can preempt state laws on it and it could be one one national money and i think it could be whatever they want so and and the courts interpret these grants of power very broadly so just the power to coin money has morphed into the power to make it paper money mr kinsella yeah are you familiar with agorism yeah so there is a discussion in brazil that Agorism is not compatible with libertarianism. What do you think? Uh, to the extent I can understand it, and I actually, I was listening today to a, a podcast by uh, Victor Coleman, who was a science fiction writer who was friends with um, um, Sam Konkin, who was the kind of father of agorism, and he's putting his papers together. I had a meaning to read more into his book about that. As far as I can tell, it's sort of a tactic or a strategy is saying we should have counter counter uh, counter market activity or something. So we should kind of deal with ourselves to build up a free market. I don't see, I've never heard anything about agorism that sounds unlibertarian. I don't think it calls for violation of rights or not respecting property rights. To, to me, it's just a way people, they, they think you should live and the way you should build up counter economics to fight the state power structures. Whether it's a good tactic I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't. I don't think it succeeded in the last fifty years very well. So, can Bitcoin be an example of that? Um, I guess Uber and Bitcoin could be maybe an example of that. But to me, I don't know why you need to attach a special label to it and give credit to the agorist for that. It's just a natural phenomenon of people trying to come up with solutions. Of, to, to avoid problems caused by government, government, you know, government institutions and you know, government money. And I mean, I, I mean, would you say that when people use homeschool or when they send their kids to private schools, is that agorism because they're not 
sending their kids to government schools? Yeah, it's I'm the free market. It will be. Yeah, it will be like, I think there are three markets in, in his theory or, or more, I don't know, but black, gray, and white. And if the government prohibits it, it's black market. And if it's legal in the libertarian uh, legal theory, it will be counter economics in, in this sense. Mm. Yeah, I don't really get into strategy and tactics. I just, I, I'm waiting for liberty to happen on its own because it has to be, in my mind, liberty has to be natural. Um, it has to emerge on its own because even if we run around advocating for it all the time, we finally succeed, it's just gonna, it's gonna fade away because it's not gonna have this movement behind it all the time. I think for it to, for it to, for it to succeed forever, it's gotta be natural. And th therefore to get there, it's gotta be natural. And I think we are moving that direction because of technology and wealth and international trade, you know, the internet, social media, all these things I think are helping it. It's, I think it's happening anyway. And Bitcoin is gonna hasten it along, I believe, because I'm a big Bitcoin enthusiast. Yeah, so Konkin said that like Bitcoin will be a extremely agoristic means of, of money like he would say gold in, in his time because bitcoin wasn't a thing and the internet wasn't a thing but when he became aware of the internet he said about he talked about cryptocurrencies like in a very early stage and was it it, it was kind of prophetic it's very nice yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by him. And what's interesting about Konkin was, in a way, he was the very first guy in the modern libertarian movement to start getting intellectual property right. Um, really, I think it was Wendy McElroy, to be honest. But I think she and he were doing things. He wrote an early article called Copy Wrongs, if I remember the title right. It wasn't comprehensive, and it didn't give all the arguments, but it was very good and in the right direction. And then Wendy McElroy brought it a whole level further. I think she ushered in the modern anti-IP movement and the libertarian movement, uh, building upon the earlier work of Benjamin Tucker, which was, which was good, but it was mired in some of these lefty anti-monopoly, anti-property ideas. Um, so Konkin was really good on that too. And the interesting thing, he was really good friends with, with J. Neil Shulman, who was, a, who was a good buddy of mine. He died two years ago. And he was, of course, a hyper pro IP guy because he was a novelist, I guess, um, and influenced by Rand. So it's interesting how these early California libertarians um, were there at the beginning of, of, of the flowering of a lot of these ideas. Is there a book with Jane O'Shulman and Wendy McElroy and you, right? Well, yeah, he called it Origitent. Uh, it was really. Um, I think he, he took one of his essays and then Wendy's response to it and got me to write the introduction. <laughs> but it's like a little, it's really like three short, three articles mixed together, I think. I want to read his book. It's like, it's The Moon is a Hush, Mr. is not here. What's no, book? his book, uh, Alongside Night. Yeah, yeah, I want to read that. I, um, I really it. loved it in college, but I reread it a few years ago, and I thought, I can't believe I like this. But, but um, it's, it's got a lot of agorism built into it, and he's got an appendix talking about Tonkin's agorism, agorism. Um, it's an interesting book. The movie is horrible, but the book is… It is. It's horrible. I, all I say is I like the book in college. <laughs> you might like it. What do you think is the, the best introductory uh, book to uh, libertarian ethics? That's difficult because I used to say it was for a new liberty, but I, I reread that recently and it's it didn't hold together nearly as good as I, Rothbard's favorite book for me now is The Ethics of Liberty. Um, but Introduction to Libertarian Ethics. 
I'd have to think about that. Um, I mean, Bastiat's the law in a way, right? Um, just about the, the, the logic of plunder, which is theft, and how no group of people can do anything that their members can't do. That, I mean, that logic is kind of the essence of libertarianism. Um, I, could, I have some lists of books. I have to think about it and, and let you know. It depends upon your, your level, like if you want an introduction. Actually, J Jacob Hubert's book, Libertarianism Today, is pretty good. I won't say it's advanced, but it's, it's really good. It's a really good overview of the modern libertarian movement, but from a solid kind of Rothbardian Austrian point of view. Libertarianism Today. It looks kind of Ron Pauly from the cover, but it's 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 more than that. It's it's pretty good. I mean, I'm trying to think about the books that influenced me, but some of them are dated, and some of them are Randian, like For New Liberty. I mean, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, Ayn Rand's The Virtue of Selfishness and Capitalism: The Unknown Ideal, Milton Friedman's book Capitalism and Freedom, but those are more about free market ethics and you know things like that um I'd, ha I'd have to i'd have to think about it we better go in about five minutes so let's have a couple more questions anyone uh don't you accept don't don't you accept any level of utility by your moral system Do I accept any level of utility, like utilitarianism? Yeah. Uh, we kind of talked about this already. I think that um, consequentialism is, in other words, looking at the consequences of, of policies and laws is fine. And in fact, if you think about it, there's consequentialism is built into any principle defense of liberty because the only reason we oppose a bad law is because it has consequences. So for example, if the government says um, it's illegal to, to use marijuana, but they didn't do anything about it, then we wouldn't care if they just announced it, right? The reason we care is because they will come and get you and put you in prison. So it's consequences that we care about really. Um, utilitarianism usually implies that we can have a policy We should adopt laws and policies in order to maximize overall utility. But that presupposes that utility is cardinal, has a value, a, a number attached to it, and also that it's intersubjectively comparable. In other words, you can compare utility across people. So, for example, if we were to tax Bill Gates or billionaires and take half of their wealth and give it to the poor, some utilitarians argue that makes the world better off on the average because – The, the rich don't value their, their, their billions as much as the poor do because the poor are so poor. So they're actually trying to put numbers on these things or some kind of quantity or magnitude. But of course, that's totally illegitimate. Um, and then the other problem with ethical problem with utilitarianism is you would have to say that if we had a technique to remove per one person's eye and give it to a blind person, you would have to do that because The, the person who is, has his eye removed can still see. He's hurt, but not hurt that much. But the blind person goes from no sight to some sight. So he's benefited to a great extent. So ethical utilitarianism would lead to all kinds of horrendous consequences. I mean, ultimately we have to have principles because, so for example, I would say that even if you take Bill Gates's money and give it to someone poor and they value that more, it's still wrong because it took Bill Gates's property. So you ultimately have to backstop everything with principles. So consequentialism is fine within moderation, but utilitarianism is problematic. And I would view utilitarianism as a problematic subset of consequentialism. Hey, yeah, uh, say, Stefan, sorry. Um, going back to the books, did you mention uh, Leland Yeager's Ethics as a Social Science or Hazlitt's Foundation of Morality? Do you, are you a fan of those ones or? Not Leland Yeager really too much, um, although I haven't read that book too much. Um, Hazlitt I'm intrigued by, um, and, and I think it was in that book where he coined the term co-op cooperatism as a better term for libertarianism, which I kind of like to be honest because it gets at the essence of what we're about. We're about a system that allows us to cooperate 
instead of having violent conflict. Um, I, I intend to re I've, I've been intending to read that book from beginning to end. I, I, I read through it years ago, but I want to I want to study it more. I'm intrigued by him actually. Mr. Kinsella, yeah. I don't know if you know, but Brazil is the first in the ranking of online piracy. In the view of anti-IP law, should I be yeah. proud of that? No, I have no problem. With, I have no problem with. Um, I have no problem with. Like, I, I don't agree with some libertarians, like even Randy Barnett as a quasi-anarchist. These guys come up with these arguments for why there's. Uh, an obligation to obey the law, even if it's unjust law. I don't agree with that at all. Um, I think that if a law is unjust and if it's obviously unjust, there is no moral obligation to respect that law. There could be a prudential obligation, like it could be unwise to 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 violate laws. But I think evil laws um, can be evaded. And, and I think copyright is such a law. So I think that actually the rise of torrenting and encryption and file sharing and digital information has allowed widespread evasion of copyright law, which is a really, really, really good thing. Um, what I'm hoping for is something similar could happen to patents when 3D printing matures. Now, I, I think this may take 50 years from 3D printing to get to the point where you could print an iPhone or a car. But I don't see why that's not possible someday. But once you have 3D printers that are extremely advanced, I think you'll be able to circumvent patent law just like we can circumvent copyright law with, with encryption right now. So you think like a 1700 Switzerland, but decentralized, like no IP laws and everywhere, like everywhere is a Switzerland of itself. Well, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, I, I'm, I'm an anarchist, so I've, I favor decentralization and as many small city states as possible would be good. I'm not sure I see the connection to the IP issue. Um, uh, Switzerland had no IP laws in the 1700s. I think it's Switzerland. So I was just saying that it will be every house is, is a Switzerland of itself. Well, if a, country, if, if a country doesn't have IP law, they're not pirating because it's not illegal then. Piracy means violating the, the copyright or patent laws of your country. Um, so like in China and in Brazil and in Turkey and other countries, piracy is more widespread. It's, piracy is widespread in the US too, of course, which just means people are evading the local copyright law. Um, but if, if a country decided not to have copyright, like let's say that um, let's say that Switzerland withdrew from the Berne Convention and they abolished their copyright law, that would be completely legal in, under international law. So if they copied Hollywood blockbusters and novels and software in that country without permission, they would actually not be doing anything illegal because you, don't, you can't violate US copyright law in Switzerland. You would only violate Swiss copyright law. So that wouldn't even be piracy. But I don't see any country doing that, but they could, countries could do that. In Brazil, like it's something that I don't really understand when I search for something in English and I want to download it in, on the internet. In Brazil, when I search something in Portuguese, it's so easy and I get so baffled that if I search something in English, I just can't find it. It's almost impossible. In Brazil, you, you search for it, you can download it. It's great. It's very good. Uh, it, may, it could be that the, you know, the, the big, giant, well-known tech companies are in the US, like Google, and they, they comply with the strict copyright law more. Maybe it's that. I don't know. Yeah, you'll see a Google searches taken down because of the DMCA Act and stuff. So that's probably why. Yeah, it's that yeah, it could be one reason. All right, guys, I need to go. And thanks for putting up with my incompetence in the beginning. Next time, I'm just going to do Zoom from the beginning since I know how to make that work. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank have you. a good night, everybody. Have a good, good night. night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.